Hey everybody, KMO here. <sighs> Why am I dressed like this? Is the power out? Is there no heat in my apartment? No, it's just day three of a fast and uh, it's 18 degrees outside. It's, it would be fine. <laughs> it would be fine in here if, uh, you know, I wasn't on the third day of a fast, but this is what I've noticed. One, I'm impulsive. I never look at the calendar and think, when is the most, you know, the, the most advantageous time to fast? I basically, I just feel the urge. Somebody reminds me of the idea. And it gets into my head and I'm like, yeah, let's go for it. And I always seem to end up doing it when it's cold. But being that I live in Vermont, that's a good portion of the year. Anyway, when I'm fasting, particularly a few days into it, I always get cold. Thus the hat. And... <laughs> So what's the fast done so far? Well, here are the numbers. Uh, I don't have them committed to memory, but I've lost about six pounds. Three of that will bounce back the morning that I break my fast, which is tomorrow morning. Looking forward to it. I think, and it's not just a thought, I've already committed resources to it. Uh, when I do break the fast, I'm going to go to a ketogenic diet for a while. I'm not saying I'm going to be on it forever. In fact, I'm definitely not going to be on it forever, but I'm going to be on it for a while. And I'm going to try to do it uh, not not in a vegan way necessarily, but in a less uh, animal fat oriented way. Uh, more avocado oil, less heavy cream. And I won't go into the reasons why um, in detail. I'll just point you to the video that I watched yesterday. It's from Nikola Danielov, otherwise known as Socrates. His, uh, his brand these days is Singularity.fm. And he has a long interview with the author of The Switch, somebody he's known for many years and whose work he's pretty familiar with. So it's a fairly in-depth interview. And um, anyway, it, it has motivated me to get back on a ketogenic diet, but not with the intention of staying on it forever, just to cycle through it for a time, just to switch over to, you know, metabolizing fat, getting energy from fat throughout the day. Um, just so my body is reminded that, that that is a metabolic option. I've spent most of a year on a ketogenic diet. The weird thing about starting a ketogenic diet is that I lost more weight in the first seven days of my ketogenic diet than I've ever lost on a fast. Like, I lost more weight consuming lots of calories, high in fat and protein, very low in carbohydrate, than I did just cutting all food intake. It's a very strange phenomenon. All right. On to comments from yesterday's video. I'll be upfront with you and say it's entirely from laziness. It takes longer to show you the text of the comments and to read them and to read them correctly and edit out flubs than it does to just sort of summarize them. So I'm going to sort of summarize them from memory, not even looking at them. Uh, somebody told me that it's very reasonable to believe that the COVID-19 virus escaped from a bioweapons facility in Wuhan. No, it's not. It is not reasonable to believe that at this time. It is certainly reasonable to hold it open as a possibility, but to commit to it now to the exclusion of all other explanations requires a particular sort of motivation. In fact, anytime you utter the phrase, it is reasonable to believe that, I would encourage you to just review the concept of Bayesian logic. According to Bayes, it's, it's never, or almost never, reasonable to assign a 100% certainty to any proposition. You know, if you acknowledge that there are competing explanations or competing statements which are not compatible with the thing you think is true, but which themselves don't seem to be completely false, then you really need to, well, you don't need to, but Bayes and I suggest that you think about how likely is it that this thing that appeals to me, this idea, this reality tunnel, as Robert Anton Wilson would say, is absolutely true? And if you say 100%, well, you're, you've really strayed into the realm of faith. Which, you know, faith has its strong points. Not dissing faith, you know, in the aggregate. But if you're actually trying to construct a real, you know, a realistic data-driven, verifiable, falsifiable model of the world in which you live, belief being a totally on or totally off switch, not as adaptive as it being a degree of certainty rather than certainty. So, and I'm not diminishing you 
by not knowing your name. Uh, there's a few people who comment regularly whose names I will remember and associate with particular comments. If you've commented before, I'm sorry you haven't you haven't penetrated <laughs> my attention span to that point yet. But whoever it was that was talking about Wuhan also also offered up Zero Hedge as a source. There are various types of news organizations that have alternative agendas, or maybe we could say um, unstated agendas, unacknowledged agendas in their reporting. For example, RT, Russia Today. It is funded by the Russian government. It is basically, you know, the reverse of Radio Free America. Radio Free America is where the U.S. broadcasts it po its point of view into countries where, you know, it officially isn't welcome, but the populace might be ready for it. Russia does the same to us. What What's the best way to sow discontent among, I don't want to, I don't want to oversimplify, but, you know, among the enemy population. Is it with made-up bullshit? Or is it to give a voice to these suppressed voices in that society? So if you look at Russia today, I mean, who do they get on there? You know, Abby Martin, she's the uh, personality that I most associate with Russia today, because I don't watch it regularly. But she was a podcaster, you know, when she got picked up. And she was a... Uh, I don't want to say countercultural exactly, but, you know, somebody whose whose path it was to articulate the points of view that are not acceptable in the mainstream corporate news media. And so Russia Today reaches out to her. They encourage her to, you know, put on tight clothes and lots of makeup. And then they invite on people like Chris Hedges, you know, basically sober, fact oriented critics of the American system. Now, I realize Chris has his, has his issues. I acknowledge them. He's just an example. But the point here is, is not to just make up wild bullshit, but to selectively report factual or, you know, semi-supportable or at least, you know, plausible points of view to a population which has been systematically deprived of that point of view. You know, or if, if they've encountered it, it has been from really ragtag sources, like, say, this video channel or my podcast. Uh, and the unlikely event that uh, Vladimir Putin or one of his algorithms is listening, I would be a shitty employee. Don't bother. So, Zero Hedge. Zero Hedge is, basically, it is uh, a fictional, like, it, it's published under the pseudonym of Tyler Durden. The hero of 1990s male nihilist, you know, malcontents. A figure with whom I strongly, I, I strongly identify with, not so much the figure of Tyler Durden, who's this, you know, idealistic figure, but of Jack, the unnamed Ed Norton character who, you know, creates this fantasy because he doesn't believe that he himself could live this way, but he can live that way in an alternative persona. That so appeals to me, particularly in the 90s, it really appealed to me. But Zero Hedge, while projecting the face and name of Tyler Durden, is really an amalgamation of various different authors. But they're, what's their agenda? You know, these are hedge fund people. These are investment bank people. These are people who are poised to take advantage of disequilibrium, downturns, disasters. That's their bread and butter. So you go to the Zero Hedge website, and what do you see? These are screenshots from my phone. These are just the top stories on Zero Hedge today. I can't read them aloud because, you know, I'm using the phone as a camera now. I, I don't see them. But look at them. What, what are they emphasizing? Shit's fucked up. Panic, panic, panic. How do rich people respond to panic? They sell stock. What do rich, smart people do? They buy stock when it's low. And they sell when it's high. How do you do that? I mean, obviously, that's what you want to do if you're investing. You want to buy low and sell high. How do you do it? And I forget whose quote this is. Look it up. When everybody else is feeling panicked, you should behave in a greedy fashion. And when everybody else is feeling ebullient, get out. Basically, just invest counter to the mass hysteria of the moment. So, 
you know, when tech stocks are riding high, even though the earnings for these companies don't come close to justifying their valuation, get out. When solid companies have taken a huge hit because rich people are panicking and liquidating their stock holdings, buy those assets. <laughs> now, I don't really have any investments. Cutting out a long aside, let me just say, I don't have many investments. I mean, next to nothing. And uh, in recent years, I haven't made any money from investments. And the one time I did make a decent amount of money, it was because, you know, I owned a particular piece of a company in a time when companies of its type were overvalued and their stock price was flying through the ceiling for no good reason other than just, you know, mass hysteria in the positive direction. Right now, we're in a moment of mass hysteria in a negative direction. And, you know, the, the class of people whose interests are represented by what you see on the front page of Zero Hedge, they make money when people are panicking and doing irrational things as a result of their panic. So much of what they will tell you is factually true, but the framing, you know, which pieces of the picture they, they pull out to bring to your attention and how they do it, it reflects an obvious agenda. If you think about whose interests the Zero Hedge narrative is engineered to advance. Who benefits when you get all panicky about shit? It's not you. If you are panicking, somebody is benefiting, but it's not you. And I guarantee you, all those freeze-dried eats that you have stored away, your eFoods Direct or whatever, either you're never going to eat that shit, or you're going to eat it Sometime in the future when you're broke, not because, you know, the stores are closed or the shelves are bare or, you know, the streets are full of zombies. You're going to eat it because you don't have any money to go and buy the groceries you'd rather eat. But the groceries will definitely be at the store when you eat that shit. Or if you're like me, you just don't like to go to the store. You put it off and you eat everything in the house until the cupboards are bare, and then the choice is, all right, do I throw in the backpack and walk, you know, a mile to the store, or do I bust out this nasty-ass, you know, freeze-dried, dehydrated, shelf-stable bullshit that I bought at a time of panic? And if you're buying 50-pound bags of white rice, <laughs> sucka. All right. I haven't done the editing yet, but I can tell a bunch of what I just said. I'm just going to cut it out. If you want to hear me ramble at length, subscribe to my podcast. You'll get all the KMO rambling about whatever uh, at length and in minute detail that you then you can possibly stomach, probably. And also conversations with smart and informed people. So I hope that you will check that out. And the only way to get my subscriber-only podcast these days is through Patreon. So, while I should do this in every single video, in this one I absolutely positively will get a Patreon link down there in the description. And I'll put my uh, Twitter link down there as well. You know, I, I got kicked off of Facebook, um, I think it was the summer of 2018. And no, nothing has risen to replace it in terms of, you know, the amount of time and effort and attention that it sucks out of me. But the closest thing to a replacement to Facebook for me has been Twitter. Uh, I do at least check, you know, mentions and notifications and things once a day on Twitter. So if you want to get in touch with me quickly, because if you post a comment to one of these videos, there's maybe a 1 in 20 chance that I'm going to get an email notifying me about it, but it's, it's quite likely that it will escape my notice, particularly if it's a video that's getting a lot of comments. But if you send me a direct message on Twitter, I will definitely see it. So consider those calls to action. <laughs> Alrighty, everybody, I will talk to you again later.